Well, children, if you are between kindergarten and sixth grade, Mr. Ben's right over there. It's time for Children's Church. You're welcome to leave or stay if you want to. Children, between kindergarten and sixth grade, it's time for Children's Church. Y'all have a good time learning about Jesus this morning. I know they've got a lot planned for you today. Well, take your copy of God's Word. Turn to Isaiah in the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah chapter number 40 is where we're going to be this morning. Isaiah chapter 40, of course, we're thinking all about Christmas. Christmas is a central part of our lives this time of year. And the birth of Jesus is a central part of the Scripture. It's the central part of the Scripture. In fact, we can go back hundreds of years before Jesus was born... And we can see the way being prepared for Him as everything is coming together for His birth. One of the many places in the Old Testament that speak of this is Isaiah chapter 40, where God promises His people, the Jews, although they were wayward people, sinful people, people who are about to be strongly disciplined by the Lord, He promises them that He will one day deliver them and restore them. And today, you and I, as Christian people, are beneficiaries of this promise. The promised Messiah, who was promised long before He came to this earth as a baby in Bethlehem. And His miracle that He brought with Him, that is everlasting life, is available even to us today. So I want us to think about Christmas this morning, about the comfort of Christmas that we find in Isaiah's prophecy chapter number 40. And if you're able, would you please stand with me today for the reading of God's Word. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse number 1. Listen to this. This is the Word of the Lord. It says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double For all her sins, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. And rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we can look at your word, God. It's your word that was spoken so long ago through the prophet. But Lord, it's still just as active today as it was then. It's still just as meaningful and as life-changing today as it was then. And Father, I pray that as we consider it this morning over the next few moments, that through Your Holy Spirit You would lead us to the truth. Help us know it not just in our minds, but God, how we can live like the men and women and young people You want us to be for the sake of Your Son, Jesus. Lord, speak, for Your servants are listening. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to talk about four things this morning, and they all begin with the letter P. All right, the first one that we see in our passage is the Lord's peace. Now, while studying themes that we see in Isaiah chapter 40, I began to notice some comparisons to the Christmas story that we read about in Luke chapter 2. You know, in Luke chapter 2, that's where we have the, the greatest treatment of the birth of Jesus. That's where we read about the taxation by Caesar Augustus. That's where we read about Mary and Joseph making their way to Bethlehem. That's where we read about uh, the innkeeper, so to speak. There is no uh, innkeeper who says there is no room in the inn. That's where we read about uh, Jesus being born 
wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. That's where we read about the shepherds who are revealed uh, that the newborn king has come to them. And then they go and they worship their newborn Savior. That's all found in Luke chapter 2. And believe it or not, Isaiah chapter 40 contains some of the very themes that we read about in Luke chapter 2. In fact, I want us to think about the shepherds most of all today. The shepherds who first went to see baby Jesus. You know, the first people to visit Mary and Joseph and the newborn Jesus were the first to understand the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40. The promise of comfort. So consider this first point. This is part of the comfort of Isaiah 40. The Lord's peace. There is a shift in the overall mood of Isaiah's prophecy. If you read verse, uh, chapters 1 through 39, it is filled with strong words of discipline. Up to this point, Isaiah's prophecy has been one primarily of judgment of the Jews. He tells them that there is coming someday soon a reckoning. A reckoning for your sins of pride and arrogance and overlooking the poor. That was a big no-no in God's eyes, but the Jews were doing that in those days. But in chapter number 40, it's like the light comes on. Suddenly it's a message of positivity. It's a message of encouragement. Comfort, oh comfort, my people, says the Lord God. This shows us that when it comes to peace, it's God who takes the initiative. Not we, ourselves, but God. Our sins are what cause us to be separated from Him, and that's all on us. But the peace that God brings, well, He does that all on His own. He brings us His peace and creates the initiative so that we can come back to Him. We see examples of this peace throughout the Bible. In fact, you can go to the book of Genesis and you can read about that great flood that came upon the earth in the days of Noah and his family and how God destroyed almost all flesh on the earth. He kept one family alive. He kept some animals alive. But everything else perished in that flood. And after the waters finally subsided, Noah, the Bible says, walked out of that boat and made an altar and sacrificed on that altar. And God responded to that sacrifice by putting His bow in the sky. That rainbow that we always see when the sun's shining just right after a rainstorm. Uh, that was what appeared in the sky and it was symbolic of God's promise of peace. He was taking His bow, His bow, and putting it up to symbolize I'm no longer going to fight with you. I'm no longer going to destroy flesh this way through a flood. I will never do it again. God brought peace. In Psalm, chapter, uh, Psalm uh, number 29, the Bible says that the Lord will give strength to His people and will bless them with peace. Jesus said to His disciples the night before He was crucified, He said, peace I leave with you and my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. How in the world can Jesus say to us, don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid? Well, it's because He is the one who gives peace, but not only that, Jesus is peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Praise God for that. This was the declaration. This peace of God given by the multitude of angels to those shepherds at the first Christmas. When they said, we sang it just a minute ago in Latin, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which means glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest and peace. Peace on earth among men of goodwill. One of the first matters known to humanity about this newborn king is that he would bring them peace. And as the Apostle Paul writes, in Ephesians chapter 2, Christ Himself has become our peace. The one who brings us together as Christians. The, ones who, the one who uh, restores tattered lives, war-torn lives. It's Jesus Christ because He is our peace. Look, I don't know what you're going through today, but I would imagine that some of us in this room are going through a hard time. We're going through a family problem. We're going through a financial problem. We're going through some kind of addiction, to some kind of substance. I don't know what you're dealing with right now, but I know that if you're war ravaged in your heart, if there is restlessness in your heart, Jesus can give you peace because He is peace. That's what He grants to those who call upon His name. He is our peace. The same promise given in Isaiah 40 
is offered through Jesus today. If we are willing to claim it through surrendering our lives to Him and saying, Lord, I exchange all the war, all the brokenness, all the heartache, I exchange it to You for Your peace. Do you need that today? He says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you peace in your souls. The Lord's peace. But we also see this. Point number two. We see the Lord's presence in this passage. It was revealed to Isaiah. If you go back to chapter number seven in the book of Isaiah, you will see it revealed to him that a virgin will conceive will be with child and will bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. You remember that verse? A virgin will conceive and will bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now you know I've read that verse a lot in my life but it took me a while to finally figure out what the greatest miracle of all is in that verse. There's some miracles there in that one verse. The fact that a virgin can have a baby that's a miracle. Amen? It's only happened one time in human history. It was Mary way back 2,000 years ago when she conceived and gave birth to Jesus Christ. A virgin conceived. I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. I know there's a lot of pop theology out there that says, no, maybe that's just uh, something that the, the, the gospel writers said to fluff up Jesus. Wrong. He was born of a virgin. My salvation depends on the fact that He was born of a virgin. Okay, so I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But the greatest miracle of that verse from Isaiah 7, I believe, is when it says that she will call His name Emmanuel, which means in the Hebrew, God with us. That God would actually empty Himself of the glory of heaven and come to this earth and live among people like you and me? That's a miracle. That may be the greatest miracle of them all. That God would allow Himself to do such a thing. The Lord has always been interested in humanity. He created us in His image. You are important to God. Whether you think you're important or not, God believes you are important because He made you in His image. And not only that, but He sent His Son to this earth to die for you and to raise again so that you can have everlasting life in His name and become one with the Lord, to become friends with God. The Lord has always been interested in humanity. He has always cared for humanity. He has spoken to humanity to, through the law of the Old Testament, through the prophets of the Old Testament, but in these last days, He actually took on flesh and became part of humanity. That is a miracle. It is a miracle that's worth celebrating. It wasn't until Jesus came that humanity really knew what it was like to be in God's presence. What was lost in the Garden of Eden because of sin was restored through Jesus Christ. Think about this. When Jesus was 12 years old and He was in the temple teaching all those scholars, all those scribes and, and rabbis, remember that? When those men of Ju Judaism were listening to this preteen boy teach them, they were in the presence of the Lord. When Jesus taught the crowds that were assembled there at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, when Jesus was teaching them, those people who were gathered at the mount, they were in the presence of the Lord. When Jesus ate with sinners, you know, he got in a lot of trouble for that. When he went to the home of sinful people and ate meals with them, they were in the presence of the Lord. When, when those Roman soldiers beat him, spat upon him, hit him with their fist, took the rod and knocked him over the head, when they pierced his brow with a crown of thorns, when they scourged him with a cat of nine tails, when they pierced his hands and feet and nailed him to the cross, they were in the presence of the Lord. When Mary Magdalene was at the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday and she had a conversation with somebody that she thought was the gardener of that garden, she was in the presence of the Lord. And... When Jesus ascended back into heaven, I am certain that those disciples stood there looking up at Him thinking, well, there He goes. He was here for a while. 
But now it's time for him to go back to his Father. Praise God. We beheld his glory, John says. Glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But there he goes, back to the right hand of his Father. But little did they know that only ten days later, something even greater would happen in their lives because God would rain down his Holy Spirit upon them. Now, you see, you don't have to go to Jesus. Jesus doesn't really have to come to you in a physical sense because God's Holy Spirit, the fullness of God, dwells within your life, your heart as a Christian. God's presence is always with me. I can't go too far that He's not right there with me because of His Holy Spirit. Now, I know we're Baptists. I know we don't get too excited about things, but that makes me want to shout that the Holy Spirit would come and live in my life and allow me to know God in an intimate way such as that. The Lord's presence. Maybe you feel lonely today. Christmas is a time of the year where people are prone to feel lonely. My sweet grandmother, she buried her husband last May, this last year. She's lonely. First Christmas without him. She's lonely. Maybe you're lonely for that reason or something like that. Listen, all I can tell you is that Jesus will never leave you alone. He has promised to never leave you and to never forsake you. And so if you feel abandoned or if you feel alone today, go to Jesus. He's right there. His presence is there in our lives. You don't have to go through this world alone. The miracle of Christmas proves that God is present with His people. And that's what is declared even in Isaiah chapter 40. So we have the peace of God. We have the presence of God. And number three, we have the promise. The Lord's promise is point number three. And we see this in verses six through eight. Now I've noticed that human beings are really good at making promises. Aren't we? We're really good at making promises. I've I've counseled a number of people, uh, premarital counseling in my ministry, And, you know, I make them make a promise to me during our first session. We always have four sessions. During the first session, I say to them, are you willing to promise me right now and to promise God right now and to promise each other right now that on the day of your wedding, you will promise then not to have a divorce? I make all of them make this promise that they will promise to God and to one another that we will stay together till death do us part. Because if they're not willing to do that when counseling begins, they're probably not going to be willing to do that when counseling ends, right? And you know what I've noticed? 100%, it's perfect, 100% of them say, yes, we promise. We will never separate like that, never. And I wish I could tell you that the success rate was 100%. It's not. Several couples that I've married have gotten divorced. Now, they made the promise, but they didn't keep the promise. And I can tell you that in my own life, there have been promises that I have made that I have not kept. That's just the way it is for humans. Good at making promises, not so good at keeping promises. That makes us a little bit different from the Lord because He is a promise-making God and He is a promise-keeping God. He has never made a promise that He has not fulfilled or will not fulfill. And so in verses 6 through 8, The prophet recognizes just how fickle we are. He says all flesh is like grass and the best it has to offer is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade. The reason that you and I can't keep our promises, particularly long-lasting ones that go on past our time on earth, is because we're not going to live forever. Promises that I make will eventually have a conclusion. Even if I'm able to keep it as long as I'm alive, at some point they'll bury me. And that promise can't be kept by me any longer. Now the Jews of Isaiah's day needed to be reminded of that because they were about to be taken into Babylonian captivity. They needed to know that the the attack of the Babylonians is temporary. The promises of God are everlasting. And so they needed to be reminded that their enemy, just like your enemy, just like my enemy, He may throw things at us and He may attack and He may connect on those attacks sometimes, but they are not eternal. They have to stop at some point. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. 
And so we have to remember that today. God has made promises that He will keep. Our promises might be limited. The promises of our enemies are limited. But God is everlasting. His promises, His Word as it talks about here in verse number 8, His Word stands forever. We can trust in things. We can trust in people. We can put our trust in armies or intellect or ability. But none of that will last. The Lord's promises will. They will stand forever. So when the shepherds went to the manger to see baby Jesus, they were going to find this one that the Gospel of John calls the Word made flesh. Now that's taking together two things that we read here in verses 6 through 8 in Isaiah chapter 40. And I don't know what exactly was in John's mind when under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he said that Jesus is the Word made flesh. But I just happen to think maybe Isaiah chapter 40 verses 6 through 8 popped up. Because there in those verses we read about flesh and how flesh is failing just like the grass and the wither, uh, the, the grass and the flowers wither, but the Word stands forever. And so the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of the life of Jesus is that that which is eternal, the Word of God, became human flesh. That which we have that is temporary, that fails, that falls apart, Amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever read in the Bible it says when you get to heaven you're going to get a new body? You're looking forward to that? <laughs> when I was a kid I didn't know what that meant. Now I'm getting a little bit older I start to understand. Yes, I'll have a new body, praise God. Because flesh is temporary. Just like the grass and the flowers. Jesus is the Word made flesh. The Word which is eternal made Himself to become like flesh that we can understand all about. Now, that's a promise that's found even in the book of Isaiah. Through the birth of Jesus, the promise made in Isaiah is kept in Bethlehem's manger as Jesus is born to save us from our sins. The same God who has made promises in the Old Testament has made promises in the New Testament. This is my point here in point number three. This is really what I'm getting at. The same promise that God has made, the same promise-making God, the same promise-keeping God in the Old Testament is the same promise-making and promise-keeping God in the New. And so He promises that if you call upon His name, He will save you from your sins. He promises this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if, if, anybody would be faithful, if anybody would confess their sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. He's made that promise. He's made the promise that He will forgive us and save us. And He's made the promise that He will come again. John chapter 14 let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again to receive you unto myself so that where I am, you may be also. That's a promise Jesus made. And I believe it's a promise He's going to keep. God is good. He's a promise making. He's a promise keeping God. You can depend on this word. It will never fail. Because the one who authored it will never fail. Remember God's promises. And let me close with this. And that is the Lord's proclamation. The Lord's proclamation. We see it in verse 9. Beginning in verse 9, Isaiah turns his attention back to the matter at hand. He said the Lord's going to bring peace to Judah. He's going to bring His presence to Judah. He's going to keep His promises to Judah. And so now there's a job to do. He says, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news, of the Gospel, lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. The Lord had an announcement to make. And isn't it interesting that He chose to let the people of Jerusalem make the announcement? I've never quite understood this. It's a mystery. But God, in all of His majesty and glory and perfection, wants to use me, a very imperfect vessel, to proclaim His good news. 
That's a mystery to me. And the same is true for y'all today. Because you're imperfect too, believe it or not. You're imperfect. And the perfect God of creation has chosen you to proclaim His good news to others. You and me. So when the shepherds came to visit the baby Jesus, as I said earlier, they were the first people outside of Mary and Joseph to see Jesus. The first people. That's amazing. It wasn't a king who was the first to see Jesus. It wasn't a priest from the temple. It wasn't some uh, member of the nobility or a Pharisee who was the first to see Jesus. It was lowly shepherds. I mean, they had been out working with their flocks in the field. They probably smelled like sheep. They probably looked a little bit like sheep. They were probably filthy. There they are, the first people to lay eyes on Jesus. And the first people to tell about Jesus. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible tells us that after the shepherds had seen the baby, they made known the statement given about the child, and all who heard it wondered at the things told them by the shepherds. They were the first evangelists. So they saw Jesus, and then they went and told others about what they had seen and made known everything they had heard from the angels. You know, God, I've noticed this, He really doesn't care about eloquence when it comes to speaking his gospel he really doesn't care about trappings things that we think are all that important God wants obedience he wants men and women young people who are willing just to share what he's done in our lives share what's found in this word he wants us to be obedient to his call to go and make disciples of all nations and you and I can do that in fact at Christmas time it's probably the best time of the year to share Jesus with people because already the world around us is kind of engaged, kind of thinking about, well, there's a special reason we have this time of year of family and fellowship and all that. And they know maybe a little bit about Jesus and His birth. And so it gives us the perfect opportunity to tell our friends who are lost, to tell our family who don't know Jesus, to tell them, let me explain to you what Jesus means to me. Let me explain to you what the Bible says about Jesus because I'm here to tell you that much better than any gift under a Christmas tree is the gift of everlasting life that He gives to all who call upon His name. You and I have been given the Holy Spirit so that we can go and share that message with the people that we run into this week and beyond. We have been chosen to proclaim what God has done in our lives. So, are you a recipient of His peace? Do you have the peace of God which passes all understanding guarding your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? We've been given His peace. We've been given this proclamation to share with others. We've been given the presence of the Lord through His Holy Spirit. And we've received His promises which are so powerful. And so now this morning, what I want to leave you with as we are about to enter into our time of the Lord's Supper, are we willing to live as Christians who share this with others in both what we say and what we do? The Lord's Supper is a wonderful gift to us because it allows us to remember, remember exactly what Jesus did when He gave His life on Calvary. It allows us to remember how He brought us together as God's people in one church. He brought us together. It causes us to remember that He is coming again. Paul says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me until I come again. It causes us to recall He is coming again someday soon. And so yes, it's a wonderful memory of what He's done but it's also calling on us, as long as we have breath in our lungs, to go out and to share who Jesus is. And so this morning, as we prepare our hearts for that, we're going to have a time of invitation. And if you need to respond to anything I've talked about or the choir sang about this morning, now is your opportunity. 
If you need to be saved, I'm going to be standing here. I would love to share more about Jesus with you. You can pray and ask Him to save you right now. If you need to come to the altar and express something to the Lord, asking Him for help or guidance in your life, you can do that. And all of us who are Christians, we need to take this moment to ask the Holy Spirit to show us sin so that we can repent of it, we can get it right, so that we can take this meal in a way that honors the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together.